Hey there. Subscribe to my channel and also press this bell icon. So you can get latest video notifications. And this is absolutely free. You will hear a woman and a man talking about their work at a library. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello. I'm Mrs Phillips, the head librarian. You're the new library assistant, aren't you? Yes, I'm Robert Haskell, but please call me Bob. The woman introduces herself as the head librarian, Mrs Phillips, so the name Mrs Phillips has been written in. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello. I'm Mrs Phillips, the head librarian. You're the new library assistant, aren't you? Yes, I'm Robert Haskell, but please call me Bob. All right, Bob. Let me take a few minutes to explain how the library works and what your duties will be. First, the library opens at 8.30 in the morning, so naturally we expect you to be here and ready to work by then. Of course. And you can go home at 4.30 when the library closes. Now, let me explain where everything's kept. It looks like here on the ground floor is where the reference books are. Yes, that's right. Up on the second floor is where the adult collection is, both fiction and non-fiction. And the children's books are there too, aren't they? I thought I saw them in the room by the stairway. No, those are magazines and newspapers for adults. Children's books are up one more flight on the third floor. We'll take a look at them later. Let me show you how we organize our work. Do you see that brown book cart over there? The one by the door? Yes, that one. Those books have been checked in and need to go back on the shelves. Okay, so the brown book cart has books to reshelve. What about this black cart by the desk? Those books have torn pages or damaged covers. They're all books that need to be repaired. Okay, I know how to do a lot of that. I'm pretty good at mending torn pages and covers. That's great, because we really need help with that. And that white cart in the corner, what are those books for? Those are old books that we've taken off the shelves to make room for new ones. We sell them as used books to raise money for the library. So they're all ready to sell? Yes, that's right. So now you know what to do with the books in the carts. Let's talk about our activity schedule. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. I understand this library has a number of interesting activities every week. Yes, our activities are quite popular. The most popular one is story time for the children. Do a lot of children show up for that? Yes, a good many. It takes place in the children's room on Thursday mornings at 11. Isn't there a family movie night too? Yes, but it's not at night anymore. We used to have family movies on Fridays when the library is open until 9, but now we have a different activity at that time, so we had to switch family movies to the weekend, Saturday afternoon. How much do you charge for the movies? They're all free. The movie always starts at 2.30 in the reference room, 
but you don't have to worry about that since you don't work on weekends. And what takes place on Friday evenings? We've just started a weekly lecture series. We have a different speaker every week, and the lectures cover all different kinds of topics. That sounds like something I'd be interested in attending. Good, because we'll need your help with that. You'll be working Friday evenings, and one of your duties will be to set up the meeting room on the first floor for the lecture. What time will you need that done? Let's say by 6.15. The lecture starts at 6.30, and the room needs to be ready well ahead of time. A lot of people arrive early. Maybe I should have the room ready by 6? That wouldn't be a bad idea. OK, why don't I take you upstairs and show you the rest of the collection? That is the end of Part 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a talk about opportunities for temporary jobs. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. I'd like to welcome you to the presentation. It's nice to see so many of you here and I hope that everybody ends up with suitable employment as a result of attending. Now, as you know, we at Select Hotel Recruitment are able to offer a range of work at the better hotels in the area. This month is no exception, and I'll take you through some of what we have on offer. The first job is reception assistant, and there are three vacancies for this position at the Park Hotel. This is quite a varied job, and in fact I should point out that at certain times of the day it will involve heavy lifting when guests' luggage arrives or Perhaps deliveries come in, so bear that in mind when deciding whether to apply for this post. The Park Hotel has quite an international flavour, so you'll need to speak at least two foreign languages. Many guests, of course, travel by car, and you may have to take their vehicles around to the car park, so you will need to have a valid driving licence, and you will not be allowed to do the job if you haven't. They also say that basic computer skills, such as word processing, would be an advantage, although this isn't a requirement. OK, now, the next job is General Assistant, and there are four vacancies for this at the Avenue Hotel. To be honest, the pay is rather low, but there are compensatory factors that you should bear in mind when considering whether to apply. The hotel will provide you with all your meals while you're working, and they will also train you in all the aspects of the job and then issue you with a certificate, which, of course, could be very valuable to you in the future. Right. The third job on offer is catering assistant, and Hotel 56 are looking for four people to fill these vacancies at their smart new premises. As you know, this hotel is popular with exclusive travellers, and so you'll need to wear the distinctive staff uniform, which you're provided with. Don't consider this job unless you're fairly flexible about when you work, as the hotel will require you to work nights for this job, and you'll need to travel to and from the hotel as it's situated just outside the city. Well, that's some basic information about the opportunities we currently have on offer. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, if you would like to apply for one of these jobs, you'll need to follow our recruitment process. 
It might seem complicated, but we guarantee the hotels we work with to provide carefully vetted staff. So, the first thing you'll need to do is fill in one of these, a personal information form. It's pretty straightforward and should only take you a few minutes. Once you've done that and handed it in, we'll give you a questionnaire about your skills to do. Again, I don't expect this to take you very long. We then look through the information about you and pass on our recommendations to the relevant hotel. Hopefully, you'll be accepted by your chosen hotel. Assuming you are, you will then proceed to the next step of the process and attend a general course of training. This is designed to be helpful and realistic, so an important part of the course is role-play activities. You should have some fun while you learn. OK, and after that, the final step is that you'll be contacted by the hotel you're going to work for and they'll post you a video about themselves and the work involved. Watching this will constitute further specific training for your job. Well, I hope that's reasonably clear at this stage. Are there any questions on what I've said so far? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear two students called Betty and Bruce talking to Professor Dundee about their own presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Come in. Professor Dundee, we're ready to make our presentation. Oh, yes. I did say one o'clock, didn't I? Please, sit down. So, who goes first, Bruce? Or you, Betty? I guess I could. Bruce is always a little shy. Not after he's had a lager for lunch, eh, Bruce? Ha <laughs> ha! No, Betty really should go first. OK, well, I'm reporting on the effects of different marketing strategies on the cheese and oil markets. Different strategies obviously affect the sales volume differently. I looked at the sales in two countries, New Zealand and Colombia. And what did you find, pray tell? Well, in New Zealand, the sales of both oil and cheese have declined pretty steadily. And in fact, the sales have decreased more quickly than the population. On the other hand, in Colombia, the volume of sales for both products has remained the same. Wait, so you said sales in New Zealand have been going down? Correct. Suppliers have introduced two new upscale brands of each product, which are a bit expensive but very tasty. The big ad agencies are trying out a new series of ads that shift the focus from health to great taste. They think that will get sales moving up in New Zealand, where the population is less affluent and generally less health conscious. Brilliant. Thank you. And Bruce? Uh, yeah. My report is about chocolate sales in Italy and Germany. The two countries' marketers have found out that you have to market chocolate differently in each country. For example, in Italy, Costig, the most expensive brand, pays shop owners to put the candy just about knee-high for an adult. I don't see. For little kids, that's about eye level. That bright red candy is the first one they see, so they buy it. Even better, they start telling their moms to buy it too. So, you mean... Well, I mean, in Italy, if you locate your product at the right location of shelves, sales do great. 
They say it doesn't matter much what brand of chocolate you're selling. As for Germany, das Land der Schokolade. Huh? That's German. It means the land of chocolate. Germans love the stuff, so people make a joke and call Germany that. Oh, uh, right. So, you were saying? Well, like you pointed out, Germans love chocolate, but they're thrifty. For a long time, the biggest selling brand was Schmutzig, mostly because it was the second cheapest, but didn't taste too bad. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Again, brilliant. A pretty good job, both of you. Tell me, what do you plan to investigate next week? I am especially interested in the effects of colour on sales of products, so I'll be looking at ads for cosmetics and cleaning products in the local market. You know, like the distinct orange colour of Mr Muscle, lavatory cleaning products. And you, Bruce? I'm focusing on the effects of different containers on sales of cookies, so I'm going to look into packaging for cookies and how the materials they use will affect the image, and in turn, sales. You know, most containers are paper, but some expensive cookies come in metal boxes. The shiny metal boxes catch people's attention, and the image remains in the memory longer. Well, it sounds like you two are all set. But as always in this course, I urge you both to pay much more attention to the advertisement extensions. That's often the key. All right. Any questions for me before you go? No, I think I'm all set. Thanks. Me too. Thanks, Professor Dundee. See you later. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a talk by a health studies lecturer on anxiety. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My talk today is on anxiety. Anxiety is something you've all experienced at some time in your life, so you'll know that it's an emotional condition in which feelings of dread, fear, and mental agitation predominate. However, what we call an anxiety state or anxiety neurosis or phobic state they all mean the same thing, is characterized by anxiety reactions far greater than those normally expected for the circumstances, and these reactions may be severe and prolonged. This is the most common form of neurosis in westernized countries. Usually, normal anxiety decreases with repeated exposure to the feared situation, whereas a neurotic anxiety tends to increase. Gradually, the person is inclined to avoid the feared situation and views it with increasing dread. Sometimes there may be an inherited tendency for this, but usually environmental issues are more important. 
The individual may have been a worrier throughout life, and a stressful condition just before symptoms set in is common. Often there is a gradual build-up of anxiety, possibly for weeks or months before the ultimate break occurs. The precipitating cause is usually one of great significance to the patient, often related to personal events such as bereavement, a breakup, threats to career, health, or personal integrity. What are the symptoms of phobia? Well, phobic states often develop into severe, crippling challenges that can be very difficult to overcome. The person develops a fear of certain situations. It's not uncommon to have one or more of these present at the same time. I'm going to name some frequent phobias and give you a description of their symptoms. Let's start with agoraphobia, which is when the person has an intense anxiety about venturing outside the safety of the normal home surroundings. It may be impossible for this person to ever go out alone. Their fear of public or open spaces is completely irrational, and they often end up leading very secluded lives. Claustrophobia, on the other hand, is a morbid fear of closed-in areas or places. If you see me taking the stairs instead of the lift, think about it. Am I trying to get more exercise, or am I trying to avoid the confined interior of the lift? And I'm sure you all know people who are afraid of flying. Sometimes it's the fear of being enclosed in the aeroplane itself, and you can imagine how the cramped confines of airline toilets are really bad news for these sufferers. Now I'll move on to discuss social phobia, which, believe it or not, is more common in men. It's an acute anxiety that develops when they are in the presence of others. They feel self-conscious, apprehensive, and embarrassed. If attention, real or imagined, is focused on the sufferer, he becomes uneasy and may blush, stammer, or stutter. Some sufferers even develop tremors, shaking or trembling movements of a part or parts of the body. Or another very common sign of their extreme discomfort is that they perspire profusely on their palms, under their arms, or on their feet. That brings me to the last one that I want to mention today, and that is single phobia. And no, it's not a fear of lifelong bachelorhood. This one is actually precipitated by an acute aversion to dogs, cats, spiders. You may have heard of the term arachnophobia. Well, it applies specifically to spiders, but any single thing can basically cause a strong aversion. Snakes, frogs, mice, or rats, for instance. I can assure you the list is unlimited. You name it, and someone is sure to have a phobia about it. Some people are terrified of the dark, for example, and I'm not talking about young children here. You'd be surprised how many adults are afflicted in this way. Well, I see our time is up. Next week I'll go into some of the treatments and therapies for phobias that have been used over the ages and some of the relatively new drugs that have recently come on the scene. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.